My goal in this video is to do a brief survey of 2 Thessalonians uh, after the manner of how I do surveys. And so diving right in, the first thing I do when I'm surveying a book is I give titles uh, to the chapters and give a sentence on each one. As I always say, uh, the, the chapter divisions were added much, much later, over a thousand years after these books were written. So they are not real, as it were, necessarily, uh, but they do give us a, a convenient pedagogical way uh, for us to get acquainted with the content of a biblical book or the section of a book. So I've titled the first chapter, God Will Make Things Right. In chapter 1 of Second Thessalonians, we, we hear that the day of the Lord is coming. And there will be a day when those who are persecuting uh, the church will get theirs. And, of course, those who are in Christ will be, will be saved at that point. Chapter 2, warning signs. So in chapter 2, uh, Paul indicates we won't be surprised by, by Christ's coming. There will be a, a falling away. Uh, he says a rebellion. A rebellion of who? Uh, that's a good question. Is it a rebellion of Christians, a rebellion of non-Christians? Uh, but anyway, a lawless one uh, will be revealed uh, who will set himself up in the temple as God. Of course, lots of mysteries here. Well, is this literal temple? Because there isn't one anymore. Did this already happen? Or is this a figurative temple? Is this the church? Um, who is this lawless one? Lots of puzzles in Second Thessalonians. Um, chapter 3, don't be lazy. So um, this is one of the themes of Second Thessalonians 3. Uh, some have stopped working, apparently, or some are idle. Uh, of course, we get the Protestant work ethic that was uh, so famous in Jamestown settlement uh, in 1607, was it? Uh, the one who does not work shall not eat, uh, Captain John Smith, uh, uh, favorite. Okay, so this is um, the three chapters of Second Thessalonians. What about the outline? Well, here is an A outline. Uh, that I came up with once upon a time for Second Thessalonians. I think if I were to do this again, I would probably group uh, 1, 2, and 1, 3 through 12 as, as introduction, and then have prescript and thanksgiving as a subheading. And I'd probably group, uh, I might group 3, 1 through 18 as a conclusion, and then have subheadings. Maybe not. But uh, So there's more than one way to skin an outline. Uh, but basically, the first two verses are what we call the greeting, or prescript, Hi, I'm Paul. Hello. Um, and then usually letters had a Thanksgiving section where you thank God for um, uh, for the audience. One of the unique features of Second Thessalonians is it seems to have a double Thanksgiving. So it has a Thanksgiving here, and then it has a second Thanksgiving down here, which is kind of uh, unique. Um, but the, the real, the core, that is the heart of the content of Second Thessalonians is this 2, uh, 1 through 12. That seems to be the real heart of, of Second Thessalonians. Of course, there is uh, another warning in this final in these final exhortations. So three one begins with the rest, kind of like Gilligan's Island, and the rest. So in Greek, you have uh, I think it's um, toi uh, to loipon or something like that. The rest, um, and so there is a clear uh, transition in the outline of Second Thessalonians here. Paul asks them to pray for him. And then he gives another warning. So this, this section one through two, one through twelve on the lawless one, and this section here, three, six through sixteen, warnings against idleness, those are the key teaching components of Second Thessalonians. And then of course we have the farewell, um, standard farewell at the end. Okay, so there is a outline of Second Thessalonians. Um, so the third part of a survey, when I do it, is I ask what are the relationships between the parts of the outline? If this is the right outline, then there are there there are relationships between the transitions. So I have pretty standard uh, pretty standard stuff for a letter. So you have introductory or preparatory material, and then you have you know concluding material. I know this is really deep stuff, um, and so I usually begin with um, when I'm surveying an outline of the New Testament, some sort of introduction. So 1, 1 through 12 introduces the letter, sets the tone for the main content of the letter, prepares, prepare you the way of the letter. Um, and then uh, questions, so usually questions of definition. I didn't, I didn't put any down. I might put what is the day of the Lord. That's kind of a definitional question. Um, I got this method from um, Asbury Seminary where I studied. Uh, and of course, uh, Asbury got this method from Robert Traina, 
uh, methods of Bible study. And in particular, uh, I've been influenced by David Bauer there, although I've made it my own. Uh, but, you know, he talks of four different kinds of questions. Uh, definition questions, how questions, why questions, and then questions of implication. So how does this material introduce the letter? Why does Paul begin the letter in this way? And what are the implications of the answers to these questions for the original meaning? Now, we're, we're asking what it meant. This is inductive Bible study. And so, um, in, in the way I do it, we're not asking implications for today yet, because it was written to the Thessalonians in the first century. So we're asking implications for them uh, at this stage of the process. Um, and then conclusion. Uh, 3, 1 through 18 concludes the letter. Why does Paul give these instructions in the conclusion? How does, how does this close the letter? And what are the implications of the answers to these questions for the original meaning of 2 Thessalonians? That's all pretty standard. So here's the most meaty pattern. Um, and that I'm calling it problem to solution. It's a form of cause to effect. So the real world situation has caused Paul uh, to write this letter. So two or three situations in particular seem to underlie or cause the writing of 2 Thessalonians. So two or three situations are the problems uh, that, that 2 Thessalonians is written to solve, so to speak. And so, for example, there is some reason, and you, you want to be as objective as possible. Pretend like you're a space alien. You know, you've come from another planet, uh, another planet and uh, you don't know... You don't know anything about this Christianity or about this letter, so you want to be as objective as possible. So there's apparently some reason that Paul is writing to them to tell them what events will precede the day of the Lord. We don't know what those uh, are exactly, and, and and so we want to stay stay objective and leave it, we're surveying. We want to leave it kind of open-ended. Paul does ask them to pray for him uh, in 3, 1 through 5. Uh, as he struggles against the opposition of wicked individuals. That's not, not a big part of the letter, maybe, uh, uh, but it is a part, and, and, and while he's writing the letter, he uses the opportunity to ask them to, to pray for him. And then in chapter 3, apparently, there's uh, some, something is causing uh, Paul to write about idleness, uh, not, you know, not working, and so forth. Um, you know, I heard a fun suggestion uh, when I was in college you know that maybe they were so maybe they were so expectant that Christ was coming back so soon uh, that they just stopped working. I mean, face let's face it, you're not going to study for a final exam uh, if you know that Christ is going to come before you know before 8 a.m. Um, and so um, it's a fun suggestion that they've stopped working because they expect Christ to come back right away. But unfortunately, the letter really isn't clear about why they're idle. And since we're surveying and trying to stay objective, we need to stay away from speculation. We want to let the letter uh, generate as many possibilities uh, as, as, as are real. Um, so th these are three problems, potentially, uh, that Second Thessalonians may be written uh, to solve. So there's a kind of cause to effect there, or problem to solution, uh, that is intrinsic to the writing of Second Thessalonians. So let's ask questions about this. So about the first one, well, what is the day of the Lord? Why is Paul concerned about them knowing signs relating to the day of the Lord. Of course, th there is the question of whether this is Paul, um, um, that some scholars have suggested that this is a, a kind of fiction, um, uh, not necessarily implying maliciousness by that, uh, but the suggestion that, that this is someone writing in Paul's name um, uh, to address a situation. If that's the case, I would think it would have had to have been written in the 60s uh, during the Roman uh, uh, war, the, the war with Rome, uh, because the temple is apparently, if you take that approach, the temple seems to be still standing. You know, the, the lawless one sets himself up in the temple as God. As God. Is this a allusion to Vespasian or Titus, you know, who started the siege of Jerusalem? Again, those are, um, those are theories that would see Second Thessalonians as pseudonymous. So I'll just raise the question, is this Paul? And then we'll go on and presume that Paul wrote it in our questions here. Uh, have there been forged letters that are alleging to be from Paul uh, about this topic that Second Thessalonians has written uh, in relation to? How will the audience know that the day of the Lord has arrived? And of course, what are the implications to the answers to these questions uh, for the context of Second Thessalonians and the meaning of Second Thessalonians? Uh, as for regard to Paul, um, the second one, what is Paul undergoing as he writes? Who are the wicked men in question who are opposing him? Why are they opposing him? How are they opposing him? 
And what are the implications of the answers to these questions for the original meaning of 2 Thessalonians? Then finally, does Paul have specific idle people in mind as he writes? Does he know some people? Talking about that, that lazy Bob, I mean, who, or is this generic? Is this just written because it's something that happens? Um, does he have specific people in mind, or is this just generic? Why are the people uh, that he's writing about idle? Why would he suspect that they would be idle? Uh, why does give Paul give this specific response to them? How is their idleness manifesting itself? And, of course, again, what are the implications uh, to the answers to these questions uh, for the original meaning of Second Thessalonians? Well, um, I end with the, the fourth thing that I do in a survey is I look for recurring themes with questions, uh, things, threads that run throughout. And so this is the one that I especially wanted to mention, that there is recurring language of persecution, of the second coming, and of judgment throughout Second Thessalonians. It is that th this is a letter that has to do with, in fact, both first and second. The Thessalonian letters are, have end time stuff. I always put that as a New Testament survey question. They relate to matters relating to eschatology and the end times. So um, the problem solution item that we mentioned um, somewhat subsumes this, takes it up into the problem solution. Uh, but we can go ahead and notice here as one of the recurring themes of Second Thessalonians is the recurring language. And it relates, uh, it relates to the reason for the writing of Second Thessalonians. Some, some questions. Where does this language occur? How many different ways does Paul express these, these different angles on the same basic um, situation? Why is this set of concerns on Paul's mind? And what are the implications? So there you have a, a fairly brief survey of Second Thessalonians. No more, and as uh, Dr. Bauer used to say, much more could be said.